uh, spraying. Psalm chapter 46, if you're listening at home, if you would like to stand or you want to take your Bible and, and open it up to Psalm chapter 46, Hebrews chapter 6, and then in just a little while I'm going to give you one more passage and we'll stay in that other passage for a while and give me just a, a little bit of time. Now, uh, one thing about the way we're doing things now is, is because of the fact that uh, we don't have all the other stuff that we are doing. We have a little more time for preaching, and so it's not to take advantage of you. You have the ability to turn it off or to leave it on and walk off, and we would never be able to tell. But uh, I feel like that old woman I used to live with, watching you, watching you, there's an all-seeing eye watching you. So I may not be able to see you, but Big Brother's watching. So Psalms chapter number 46 David writes, the chief musician here, the sons of Korah, the song of Almoth. The Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Well, he is or not. <laughs> That's personal. That's the verse that Martin Luther used to write, a mighty fortress is our God. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, sea lot, a picture of what's happening in the tribulation period, usually within two, two verses before or two after, you'll find some reference to the tribulation. But how appropriate for where we are today. Look in verse 4, there's a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, a holy place, the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that shall and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then he says again the word Selah. Quickly over to the book of Hebrews and I'll let you be seated. Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews chapter 6, come all the way to the end of the passage there, verse number 18. That by two immutable things, undeniable, unquestionable, solid, truthful things, two things that can't be changed, fixed, they're permanent, uh, permanent they're, they're irrefutable, they're unchangeable, undeniable, ironclad is I think what I'm looking for there. They're ironclad. By two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have, an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth thou within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Heavenly Father, we'd ask now your blessings upon this portion of Scripture that we've read. We'd pray, Lord, that through your help and through the power of the Holy Spirit that you might enable us to be able to preach what you've laid upon our heart. And Lord, though it is a passage in the Bible that has been preached on oftentimes by many people, might you sow us something fresh, something new, something restorative of what it is that we're about to undertake to do. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I'd like to use as a picture here uh, that if God can't lie, He tells you in Psalm 46, He said, God's our refuge. And He uses a picture in the tribulation of things that are much worse than what we have going on now to say that even though it's that bad, God hasn't forgotten you. God is going to be with you. God's going to be with you like He was the children of Israel, leading you out by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by the daytime. God's going to feed you the manna in the wilderness. And when you gripe and complain, He'll give you quail till it runs out your nose. In other words, God's uh, going to take care of you. It may not be how you think it ought to be done. I've seen a lot of people that have drawn great uh, uh, attraction to or are given uh, attendance to the passages of the plagues of Egypt as if uh, these are the plagues of Egypt and these are the things that we're uh, going through worldwide as if you're already in the tribulation. While you might make a type, you're not in the tribulation. 
You may have tribulation, but you're not in the tribulation. You're not in the time of, of Jacob's trouble. But during that great time, the Lord still, in the deliverance of His people, didn't do it the way the people thought it should be done. There were some immeasurable obstacles along the way, not the least of which was being released from Pharaoh who did not want to let him go. And once they got out there, they were pursued by that army and they ran into a huge obstacle called the Red Sea and it looked like there was no escape. So much so that there were individuals, I'm sure, that were going to try to work some kind of a compromise with Pharaoh and say, listen, if you just won't kill us and let us go back and to the garlic and leeks of, uh, of, of Egypt, we'll go back over there and we'll go back to work for you and we'll make bricks and all that stuff. And it was Moses that got us into trouble and those kind of things. I'm positive that that was going on. And yet the Lord said to Moses, take the staff and extend it out there, the Red Sea, and, and part the Red Sea, and the people walked out on dry, dry land. Oftentimes when we go through times in this difficult uh, era that we're in right now, we think, man, this is a time like nothing's ever been before. Yet there have been people that have suffered around the world ever since the world began. Since Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, there's been murder. Cain was born and Abel was born and Cain slew Abel and murder was here from the beginning. And from that point on, you've had nothing but conflict and wars and floods and difficulties and problems. The issue is not whether or not those things are here, ladies and gentlemen. The issue is, what do I do when those things show up? There can be a trial of our faith. Where do I run? I run to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. He says to you clearly in Psalm 46, unless he can lie, but he just said he couldn't. He said, I'm your refuge. I'm your very present help in a time of need. So if we can learn that most important thing, and what I'm going to try to show you today is some things called the cities of refuge that will show you pictures of Jesus Christ in every one of those cities so that if you have any kind of problem, the issue is I need to get to the city and in the, for the sake of a typology today, I need to be able to get to the city of refuge. Well, while you're in Joshua, or turn to Joshua chapter number 20 if you would, and then flip over if you will please to Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. Uh, somebody said the other day, Preacher, when you get going, man, you're, you're really talking fast. You're talking so fast, I, I, I can't even write the notes down. I have a lot on my mind. It, it, I've learned this. It's, it's difficult when you're preaching to empty pews uh, because you're not getting feedback. So pauses that may last a second or two seem like they're 15 or 20 seconds long. Uh, when you tell uh, maybe a little bit of a joke, a little bit of a funny, and there's no feed feedback, no grin, no pushback, no nothing, or if you uh, kind of drop the hammer, drop the plow down a little bit, there's no feedback, you have a tendency to just try to keep talking. So I apologize for talking fast. Slow it down to 33 RPMs if you can. But I want you to look into Numbers chapter 35, and let me tell you a couple of things before we get into the cities about the importance of where the cities were laid out and how they were laid out. I know that when we were in Moldova two years ago now, we were over in Moldova, me and a bunch of folks went over there and, and we had the privilege of being over there in that, uh, that particular area of to, on, a, on a mission trip and so on and so forth with Brother Hamilton and they treated us like kings over there and we had the privilege of, of being able to go and visit people and see some people saved and in the orf orphanages and, and so on and so forth. I was asking Vanya, who was the interpreter that was there, who knows about seven or eight languages without even having to think, I asked Vanya, I said, how is it that you find your way around this city? How is it you can, you can figure out where you are? And he goes, oh, well, and we stood outside the bus for a minute. He said, do you see that tower right there? And I said, yeah. I said, a big old antenna standing up out of the ground. And he said, yeah. That, I said, I see that right there. He said, you can see that tower from anywhere in this city. And that tower is the center point of the city. I know the road that that's on, the street that that's on, the section of town that that's on. So no matter where I'm at in the city, I'm able to look at that tower. It gets me my bearings. And if I don't know where I am, I can just keep going toward that tower until I recognize the area in which I'm in. You know something that's profound? You know what happens to us often because of sin in our lives or oftentimes because of chaos in our lives or catastrophe in our lives, problems or difficulties or, or death or divorce or disease or whatever it may be. You know what can happen sometimes? We find ourselves in uncharted territory. 
We find ourselves in a place where we don't really know where exactly we are. You know what he's saying there? He's saying the Lord's like that radio antenna. If I can get my eyes back on where that is, I may not be able to, to know exactly where I am now, but I know where that place is located. And so if I can walk toward that place, that location, I can find my way back to familiar ground or familiar territory. If you're in Numbers chapter 35, the first thing I want to say is, is that these cities were laid out in high places. High places in the sense of being visible to everyone. High places in the sense of what's the point of having a place or a city of refuge if people don't know where it is, if they can't find it. They didn't have GPS systems back then. They didn't have the ability to speak to Siri or Bixby or, or Google or whoever else is out there now, Alexa or whoever else it might be. In my car, it's Joan. And when I ask for directions and she talks to me, she sounds like a demon-possessed Jezebel. But at, but at any rate, um, she's given, she gives me direction. I, I'd like to... Never, never mind. But here's the thing you need to realize or understand. He didn't, they didn't have that. And you never know when something is going to happen unexpectedly and all of a sudden, you need the city of refuge. Here's the thing that happens. Oftentimes, something can be plainly visible to us and we know where it is, but because we haven't accessed it in a long time, we take it for granted. And it's there, but it's not there. It's kind of opaque. It's not really there. It's like that picture hanging in your living room and you haven't looked at it in a while. You know it's there. But it's been a while since you appreciated the detail of the picture. been a while since you looked at where it was hanging. been a while since where you bought it and what was involved that you thought about it. You know that it's there, but you sort of take it for granted. It can be that way in marriage sometimes. Ma'am, sometimes you can take him for granted. I realize he's just an old clumsy old oaf now and he's not anything like he was when you married him. And now you're thinking 10 years later, what in the cat hair did I do? But too bad you're stuck with him now. But uh, could I just say this to you? Sometimes you might take him for granted. Maybe he's not worth of powder and shot to take to dispatch him into eternity, but he's trying to do some things for you and maybe he doesn't do all he should do. But maybe he is doing something. Maybe if you accented more the positive instead of all the negative all the time, you might see some more positive behavior. Uh, men are like that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the guys around here, they're probably different. All you guys, y'all are all probably entirely different. But uh, when I do something that I like, want to get her to come out and look at it and go, uh, what do you think about that? She does stuff for me all the time and I don't ever come by and tell her thank you or appreciate it. I ask her to do something and, and she'll get back to me. Men want you to find it. Men want you to know you ask them to do it and then they want to see if you went and found out because men kind of think that they're, uh, they're, they're the most important thing. And so instead of reporting back to you and telling you it was done, they want to find it and they get mad when you, went, when you haven't told them, oh, yeah, honey, you know, I fixed that wall for you. I painted that place for you. I, I got the grass cut out there. You know what you want to do? You want to get them to bring them out. Hey, you see, see what I did there? You, you want the, I'm just simply saying to you, sometimes you can take that husband or that wife for granted. Sometimes you can take your kids for granted. Sometimes you can take mom and daddy for granted. Mom and daddy may not be everything you think they ought to be, but they're still putting clothes on your back and food on your table and a roof over your head. Maybe you might accent the positive. Well, they don't give me a phone. They don't give me a car. Good for them. <laughs> they don't give me this and they don't let me do that and so on and so forth. Good for them. You know what you ought to do? Thank you, mom and daddy. Appreciate what you do. You might find you get a little bit more. But my point is this, ladies and gentlemen, oftentimes that radio antenna, that tower that's up there in the middle of the city, you, you, go, you drive by it so much you don't even realize it's there anymore. You don't even recognize that it's there anymore. First time or two you drive over to work, you're paying attention to all the roadblocks, you're paying attention to all the uh, marks of, of different things and different buildings and, and so on and so forth. And then you drive there and you don't even see this stuff anymore. It becomes kind of opaque. Can I say this? First of all, it was in a high place because there's no point in having a city of refuge that people can't find it when the time they need it is available. You never know when it happened. The city of refuge is set up that when an accident occurred, somebody could run to immediately to prevent themselves from being uh, uh, um, uh, uh, killed, murdered, or not murdered, but killed as a result of what they did. Look in verse 25. And the congregation shall, in their numbers 35, the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood. And the congregation shall restore him to the city of refuge, whether he was fled and shall abide unto it the death of the high priest and was anointed in the holy place. Now, I need for you to understand a couple of things there. Uh, number one, I'm not there to, 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 to reconcile or try to straighten out things between him and the other individual. I'm there to reconcile that individual and to relieve them of the pressure as far as their relationship with the Lord is concerned. 
oftentimes we have people that come here. Right now, in this time of turmoil, you're having people that are contacting you on a regular basis, and they're saying, what do we do? For you, you represent to them that city of refuge, that place of refuge. But you know what it's supposed to be? It's supposed to be in a high place. And I won't spare the, or take the time to tell you, but all the rocks and the stones were supposed to be cleared out of the way on the pathway. And the pathway was to be clearly marked with signage so that anybody would have no excuse that I was trying to get to the city of refuge, try to get to the place of relief, try to get to the place of, uh, of, of restoration. And I couldn't find it because there was no directions. I couldn't find the Signs were kept pristine, clear. The bushes were kept out of in front of them so people could see them. The stones and the rocks were kept out of the way. You know what that is for us as Christians? That's we're supposed to help people get to the place of refuge, not block people on the way. Not talk about the hypocrites in the church and not talk about the people that do or don't work in the nursery or the people that do or don't uh, do this and that and the other. You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to clear the pathway. We're supposed to unclear, uncheck the, 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 the things that are in the way, the debris and stuff in the way, and keep that swept up. We're supposed to help them and assist them not be a roadblock to them. I realize for some of you, you've heard uh, at least bits and pieces of the mis message before, but I think it bears repeating, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that oftentimes the reason in times like this that the church doesn't increase inside is because so many people are cluttering the pathway on the way outside that it keeps people from coming onto the inside. Because at a time like this, people desert Jesus Christ and say, well, Lord, how could you let this happen to me? And I'm not just talking about what's going on as far as the disease is concerned. Sometimes horrible things can happen to you. You can get sideways or crossways with another brother or sister in Christ and you're on the road away from the city of refuge. By the way, in 2 Samuel chapter uh, number 3, you find a man by the name of Abner who happened to kill Joab and uh, uh, Abishai's brother. And uh, Abner goes to the city of refuge over there at Hebron, which will be there in just a little while. And Joab uh, talks Abner into coming out by the gate. And as soon as he steps out the city, Joab kills him. Even though King David had made peace with him and they were trying to reunite the kingdoms because of what had happened between Joab and Abishai and Abner had killed uh, Ashiel who was chasing out after him and he warned him and he warned him and he warned him and then he turned around and stuck a spear and the spear went through him and he killed his brother. Joab's bitterness caused him to kill somebody David had made a peace pact with. I could preach a whole sermon on that right there. The fact is, is that David has sat down and has made a peace pact with, with Abner. And you know what he said to him? He said, listen, now that we've got this going, Abner said, I'm going to bring all of Israel together and be uni united. And I'm going to fall under you and your authority and I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And so they make a peace pact and he lets him go. And Joab comes in and said, don't you know that's the guy that killed my brother? And how could you let him go? And how could you let him get out there? And David knows nothing. The Bible specifically says David knows nothing. And Joab talks him as one of David's generals, the main general, talks Abner into stepping out. And guess what happened? Happens, he winds up getting killed. And the story there is not just that he stepped outside of the city of refuge and therefore he winds up getting killed. The story there is, is that in spite of the fact that the king says, we've now made a peace pact and it's good for the nation of Israel, Joab just could not let it go. And so as a result, you know what happens? Abner winds up dead and the Bible says David followed the beer there. It's called B-E-I-R. That's the casket. And David weeps and the nation of Israel weeps and the people weep and that kind of a thing because Joab couldn't hold it. And when David's dying over there, he calls his boy Solomon is and he said, you hold that old man when he gets a hoary head, a white head, he gets old and don't let him rest even in his old age. Hold him accountable for what he did to Abner because in coming against Abner, he came against me. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says that when you sin against your brother, you're sinning against God. I'm going to get to the good stuff here in just a little while. I hope and pray you'll stay with me long enough. But you know what I've seen? I've seen a huge desertion in churches for every reason you can even possibly imagine. And there's so many people that are leaving the churches for whatever the reason might be that the people that need to come into the city of refuge, they can't get there. You say, well, there's obstacles along the way. There's people putting up detour signs. There's people that are saying, that ain't the place to go. Don't go to that place. Come meet with me in my living room. Come meet with me on the internet. Come meet with me over here and meet with me there. And you know what the Lord's saying? Why don't you just get out of the way and don't block the way? 
Joab is also guilty for what he did when he killed uh, Amasa over there. Uh, Joab is along the way there and Amasa kept getting in the way and David said to let it go. You know what Joab did? He grabs him and sticks him underneath the fifth rib and leaves him wallowing right there in the middle of the, of the pathway. And all the soldiers that go by there, they see where Amasa's killed. And you know what they do? They walk by that place, man, and they're looking at him. They're squallering and squallering in his blood until he dies. And it slows down everybody else. And everybody has to stop and try to go around him or take detours or turn to the right or turn to the left and all that. You know what that Bible says about when Abner was killed? That Bible says that all those that when they came to the place where Abner was killed, they stood still. That isn't the message today, but I just wonder how many have uh, deserted because, you know, God has let them down and God hasn't let them see their, their dreams fulfilled and God doesn't let them work and God's not providing and God's not taking care of and God's not this and the church that and the church this and the road is cluttered with rocks and stone and debris and branches and leaves. It looks like a hurricane blew through uh, New Orleans when Katrina came through and there's just nothing but dead stuff laying all over the road and the signs are down and people need right now a place to be able to run. And where's the city of refuge? Where's the city of refuge? Where's the place? Where's the person of refuge? Why, it's Jesus Christ. Why, I, I can't see Him. There's, there's debris in the way and there's damage in the way and there's all kinds of things going on that are blocking my ability to be able to get to that radio tower to get back to the person of Jesus Christ. You see, ladies and gentlemen, while I'm going to try my best to help you today, I want you to understand something. There becomes an incumbent responsibility upon each of us as Christians not to be the distraction, not to be the debris that lies in the roadway of other people being able to get to Him. Oh, sure, I've heard it preached all kind of ways that the debris is drinking and smoking and cussing and, and all those other kind of things. You know something? I have friends that smoke. Say so you shouldn't have fellowship with them. Well, then I shouldn't have fellowship with you because you're gossiping or you're slandering somebody. Well, the Bible says, you know, no, you're, you're getting kind of specific. You're getting to be one of those holier-than-thou individuals that says, I can't have fellowship with anybody that's not just like me. Well, then go look in the mirror and have fellowship with yourself. Because people are people. My job is not to straighten somebody's pictures on their wall. My job is to try to keep the way clear because the only one that can change them is Jesus. I know some individuals that smoke. But they don't cuss as much as some of you do. I know some individuals that cuss. But they don't slander people the way you do. I know some people that say some things uh, even in a, in a gossiping standpoint. But they don't. Look, some of the things you do. See, see, the issue becomes, am I a debris along the roadway? Suppose today you're one of those individuals, maybe a shut-in, maybe somebody that's getting on up there in age. Maybe you're one of those individuals that's at high risk of, of uh, being able to catch the virus or whatever. I don't care what you say. I don't, I don't make a hill of beans to me what you say. Somebody that's by themselves and they've been told that they could possibly get it and die and die by themselves, you trust me when I tell you they're afraid. I don't care if you're a Rambo and you've got the boldness of a lion. The bottom line is, is that they're afraid. You don't get to imprint yourself over on them and question their spirituality. They're more spiritual in their pinky than you are in your whole hand. The issue is, is am I blocking somebody? The message is not going to help you at all. You say, why? Because you're causing a roadblock. I'm wore out with trying to tell Christians church is good for you. Church is good for you. You know, if anything, we've learned this. We've learned I like being together, <laughs> hemorrhoids and all. But I like gathering together in the church house. I like to be able to get together and, and to see people and to talk to people and have fellowship with people and, and worship together and sing together and the vivid memories come back. But you know what can happen? Sometimes as much as at times the moon in its little tiny infant, in, 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 in uh, a very small way can eclipse the sun. The moon's a picture of the church. Moon's also a picture of your flesh. It's dead. And you know what can happen? Sometimes that moon can position itself just right, and that little bitty moon can block out that big old giant sun. And you know what can happen sometimes? We can block the path coming back to the place, the person, the city of refuge for individuals that need to get there for help. There is a need today for people to be able to get back to Jesus, back to the basics. 
I just say this, this is my personal opinion and I'm going to move to the cities and I'll move through them as quickly as possible to try to help you. But can I just say this to you, ladies and gentlemen, I think right now is a great time for you to be able to be talking to people about Jesus Christ. I don't think it's a great time to be discussing politics. That ain't helping anybody right now at all. Or discussing what's going on in another country. That's not helping anybody right now at all. I mean, to think about this, the foolishness of that. Uh, you're talking about things that talk about the economy and talk about uh, things that are going on as far as the world is concerned. But right now, people have a spiritual need. There's a deficit in the land. There's a dearth in the land. Listen, the preaching of the Word of God that goes out, they need to hear what you have to say. But too often what they hear us say is, well, I went to that church one time, but the preacher did so-and-so. His wife did such-and-such. Such. The deacon did. The trustees did. Well, they decided this. Well, I'm not going to do, I'm not going, I'm not going to do this. Oh, uh, they played a song and they didn't let me play. They didn't let me sing. They didn't let me preach. They didn't let me teach. They didn't do it how I thought. They didn't consult me. They didn't, uh, you know, uh, okay, all right. So you know what you are? You're in a mesa in the middle of the road and people are having to try to get around you. You're debris along the roadway. Nobody can clear you out of the way. You have to be willing to recognize, you know something, I'm supposed to be a burning and shining light pointing people to where to go, where to go. Over a lot of years, I, I was a policeman. I think most of you know that. And, and uh, there, was a, there was a strange thing that would happen every now and then. Uh, with two, two main reasons. Number one, when the power went out, especially in the downtown grid, I mean, you know what they were doing? They were looking for somebody to give them direction. Otherwise, you could have intersections where you could have horrible wrecks and accidents like Brother Brad got into there. You could have horrible accidents and things like that because they needed somebody with control. But more than that, they needed somebody with direction. And they would pull up. And you know what they would do? They'd pull up there and then, well, which way do I go? And you'd say, hey, two blocks go down here and turn right or two blocks and go left or go straight ahead or tell me where it is you're headed. Okay, that's over here. You're going to have to make a U-turn and head back this and that and the other. You know what they were looking for? They, that wasn't enforcement. That's just, can, can you just tell me why? The lights are out. The signage is down. I don't have the things I need to get to where I'm going. And the second thing would be is after sometimes we would have the big huge ball games and back then it was the Gator Bowl and then Alltel and all that. And then you know what we had to do? We had to take control of the traffic lights in order to be able to funnel the traffic away from where the congregants were gathered and be able to get them safely back home. You know what we need to be today? I know this is going to make some of you sick, but you need to be a traffic policeman. Hey, I don't have the answers, but he does. I don't have the answers, but he does. Go right and find him. Can I show you these cities right quick? Let me just say that in Numbers 35, you can take the time to read it. There's also a passage in there that says if they leave the city of refuge and something winds up to get them, then they reap what they sow and you're not to have pity on them. But I don't have time to go into that. That's a doctrinal meaty message right there. And I don't want to be negative about those kind of things. Murderers are excluded and, and other people that do horrible and terrible things. Can you come to uh, Joshua chapter 20 now? If you're still with me, pay attention uh, for just a few minutes here this morning. Uh, notice he says this, if you will, verse number four. And he that doth flee unto the one of the cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city, shall declare his cause, the ears of the elder city, and they shall take him into the city unto them that give, give him a place that he may dwell among them. Can I say this first of all? When they come in, it's not your job to look at them and determine whether they should or shouldn't. They're just wanting to get shelter in time of a storm. I realize there are exceptions. I realize to the rule. I realize there are times where you have to pay attention because you can't let everybody in uh, for certain reasons and certain things. But when somebody comes to church, when somebody comes to Jesus Christ, it's not our job to review their history or their past or get them to confess to us everything that they've done. It's our job to just point them to Jesus Christ. You know what he said? Receive them. That means you might even have to receive some people that are trying to find Jesus Christ that you might not even like or don't care about. But after all, that's what the body of Christ is. The body of Christ is not everybody like you. The oddity is, is that once you get saved, you don't lose your personal identity. The oddity is, is that if God was so concerned with everybody being like you are, he, he would have removed the conflict. But here's what happens. He allows people in our lives to jostle up against us like sandpaper against some wood in order for it to be able to fit in the proper place. 
It's like the keystone that goes in the archway, that thing that's shaped just right. What holds that thing in there, and they used to do it in the days of Rome, they used to set that in there without any mortar. They would put all the rocks and then drop that keystone in there, and the weight on that keystone would cause that thing to maintain its shape. Well, you know what the Lord does? You get saved and you come in here, and guess what happens? People rub up against you and rub up against you, and they call rub you the wrong way, and they irritate you, and they frustrate you, and they agitate you, and you're, you know, I can't lie. I don't, I, God would be, I mean, the church would be great if it wasn't for people and the world would be great if it wasn't for people. What you're really saying is, is the world would be great if everybody was like me. God doesn't take away your identity when you're saved and He doesn't for a reason. Why? We need the interference from other people for God to shape us into what He wants us to be. Don't ask God to remove the shaping instruments in your life. Sure, there are people that irritate you and agitate you, but I'm going to ask you this question before you point at them and say they're the problem. What's God doing with that person's problem in your life to have you fit the hole that He wants you to fit into? And too often, the very thing that we think is hurting us the most is helping us the most because we don't realize, you know something, there's a lot of things I see in that person that God probably sees in me. Husbands and wives, that thing applies on a regular basis. You having a problem with your wife, the Lord's like, yeah, tell me how, tell me about that. I got a problem with my wife, talking about the body of Christ. You got a problem with your husband, the Lord said, yeah, I know exactly how that feels. Look, if you will, please, in these cities right here, he says there, uh, number one, he says, take him into the city and give him a place. Give him, give him a place, a, a place to rest. And then he said, if they pursue after him, don't deliver him back up. In other words, kind of, kind of try to block him along the way. Uh, try to make sure that you keep them safe. And I remember when we were in South Africa with the Swanapools down there and Eric and Evelyn and all the kids that were there and, and, uh, and Clay and his wife. And we went out there and they took us to see all the big five of the animals and, and this and that and the other. And the next day after we went to see the, uh, the, the animals and stuff like that in these big cages and all, our big uh, enclosure things, whatever, everything's big in Africa, including, but at any rate, it, it's, it's huge. And uh, the next day, they brought me out the newspaper. And in the newspaper, this Japanese man, a little fellow, had been killed because he didn't stay in the car where it was safe. In all of these places, they tell you in certain areas, stay in the car, stay in the car, stay in the car. And so what he had done, it wasn't in the park we were in, it was in another park. What he had done was, is he had gotten out of the car to take a picture of a lion that was off in the distance. And he thought, well, I'll get out. And instead of leaning through the window and adjusting it, he got out. And of course, they were telling him to get in and get in and so on and so forth. And the lion's laying out there. And unbeknownst to him, a lion had slipped up down the side over there, came through the grasses and stuff. And before anybody could say anything, had grabbed that man by the head and drug him off into the, into the jungle. That's what the newspaper article said. Another newspaper article was, is when you go into these places, if you happen to see the elephants, don't challenge the elephants. <laughs> now, that's, uh, to me, that makes perfect sense. You're looking at an elephant, and they're way up here like this, and you're driving a little old bitty car like that. I'm thinking, you got the right of way, man. Let me just back up and get out of here. Well, instead, this car just kind of had a little, you know, game of chicken there with the elephant, and the elephant stomped on the car and took them tusks and rolled that thing. They had a picture of the car that looked like it had been through a trash compactor and laying off in the ditch. You say, what's the illustration of that, preacher? The illustration of that is this. When people come in here, your job is not to attack them, it's to protect them. If you see them doing something that may hurt them because they're running with the wrong people and doing the wrong things and, and those kind, you know what you need to do? You need to say, listen, just stay in here. Stay in fellowship. Stay with the right kind of people. We have people that come to church all the time. They're very easily offended. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want anything to do with this. I want people to leave me alone. You can't help people like that, but don't you be the one that runs them off. You be the one that doesn't in a hurry run them back out there into the world and give them the opportunity to get into trouble. All right, six cities. We'll run over them as quickly as possible. Give you a couple of illustrations. If you want to take some notes, you certainly can. Notice what he says. First of all, these cities that are built up there and the, the days come down to verse number seven. And he appointed Kaddish. What is the city of Kaddish? Kaddish is a holy place. It's a clean place. It's a place that you can come if you're dirty. 
Uh, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood shall lose all their guilty stains. Holy means separated. It means, it means to come apart. It means clean. It means pure. You heard me use the illustration before when the old preacher and I would go to prisons and stuff and, and back in those days uh, the other guys would go with us and help us and I'm sure they have their own illustration but I, I remember being in Orlando. They have a female chaplain there that's over the females. She's an excellent chaplain. I don't know if she's still there. Her name's Westmoreland. Really, really fine lady. Fine husband. Love the Lord. Believe the book. And did what they could to minister to those, uh, to those women. And we had a, a, a small area there that they allowed us to gather. And they, they treated us really nice. The, the correctional officers gave us plenty of leeway there. There was no pushback or problem. And we got in there and got the board and easel set up and sang a song or two that the females led there. And the old preacher gets up and drawing, you know, the, the crucifixion and uh, behold the man and that kind of a thing. And he gets through drawing the thing and he gives the invitation. And I'm having to stand because the place is packed full. And those old uh, terraza looking floors, that those old uh, tiles that used to find in old churches years ago. And, and uh, pews like this, but had a vinyl covering and a wood back. And you could tell they have had their days of wear and tear on them. And it didn't look anything like this. It wasn't pristine. And, and because of the detox going on with the women in there, there's about, oh, I don't know, 70, 75 women in there and, and us in there. And, and even though the air was running in there, it just became sort of damp. It became sort of wet, sort of, sort of muggy feeling in there. And because uh, their, their breath and detoxing and sweating and detoxing, some of them with skin poppers on them and, and, and teeth gone because of meth and those kind of things. And they're sitting there and he gives the invitation and can't have them come to an altar because of the confined area. And so, you know, one at a time he's asking them if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior for the very first time and you really believe you're a sinner and leads them through the whole thing. No easy believism. And so I'm sure I'll get a card and a letter on that one. But he walks them through that whole thing. And one by one, you're seeing them slide off the pew there. And, and I'm watching this girl. She's sitting in the very back. And I think she was only about 21 years of age, maybe, maybe not even 21, maybe 20, 19, 20 years old, young girl. But she looked like she was 40. And she sat there, and man, as he began to give that invitation, and when he was preaching up there, he's wounded for our transgressions and chastised with his peace laid upon us, and by his stripes you're healed, and he's laying the stripes on, and he's talking about the sin they've committed, and this and that and the other, and if there's any hope for a murderer, and he's talking about, you know, and can I find a sinner, and all, I mean, all the illustrations he uses, dozens of illustrations to illustrate the point, and, you know, uh, stealing stuff, and, and this and that and the other, and laying the things out there, and I watched her, I was just standing at the very back part of the door, just standing there, just, just watching or just watching her. And that lip began to quiver, the bottom lip, how like a little baby does, you know? And a little lip starts quivering and stuff and it starts moving around and those tears, man, begin running off her cheeks like Niagara Falls. And you can see them hitting down there on the floor right there and you just see them just make that little, just little splats on the wall, on the floor, just hitting the floor there. And now she's leaning forward and she's leaning down. You can tell she's sort of bent over and humped over and on that back row. And I'm thinking, oh man, boy, today's going to be the day. Boy, young and you're going to finally get some relief from that burden of sin that you're under. Man, it's going to be something. Well, he gives the invitation and she doesn't do anything. I don't even see her mouth moving. And after the end of the invitation, that chaplain follows up to make sure. She gets up and she says, Now how many for the very first time have asked Jesus Christ to save you? It's not something you've done before. We're not here to make you doubt your salvation. Gives them a little message on eternal security. And one by one, she'd say, Then testify. What happened to you today? And they'd stand up and say, I came to Jesus Christ as a sinner and I asked Him to forgive me. I'm not expecting to be released from jail, but I know this. I've been released from my burden of sin and I'm going to heaven when I die and I'm not going to hell. And on and on and on and on and on, boy. And I'm thinking to myself, come on, young, and get up. Come on, young, and get up. Come on, young, and get up. And I don't mean this in a bad way, but I mean that old girl had been through the ringer. I mean that girl had been used like that old woman at the well. She had been through the ringer and everybody had used her to get what they could get off of her and then kicked her to the curb, didn't want nothing to do with her whatsoever. I mean, you talk about deserted. You talk about left alone. You talk about nobody wanting anything to do with that was that youngin'. And she sat back there and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, good night. And I, I, she never moved. And we don't force it. We don't push it. We don't go grill them. We don't go to them, you know, and, you know, you need to make the day the day and all that kind of stuff. We just, we let it go. It is what it is. And we're getting ready to go. And the correctional officers are coming by pod or, or by cell block. And they're coming and taking out the girls and taking out the girls. And uh, me and fellas working there with me, we're rolling up the, 
the, the picture there. I remember that girl. You've heard me tell the story before. I remember that girl standing there. I, I sensed somebody behind me, but the, the fluorescent lights buzzing in that room, you could see a shadow kind of come across me like that and fall out onto that page that was there. There's a picture of Jesus Christ, and I've, I've just now rolled it past the first thief on the cross, the picture of the face over here of the, of the, the thief that died rejecting Christ. I've just now gotten it past that, and I'm almost to where his hand is stretched out, and I hear her say, don't hurt him. Don't hurt him. And I looked up at her and I said, sister, it's just a picture. I said, he's uh, not there anymore. He's risen and he's seated at the right hand of the father and never lives to make intercession. She said, he can't clean me. I said, the Bible says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as snow. I said, do you remember what the preacher was telling you about? the murderer, and she came and said, any hope for me? She said, yeah, but he can't clean me. I said, sister, if he can clean me, he can clean you. I looked over at the chaplain. She's watching now over at the side of my corner of my eye there. And I said, why don't you at least give him a chance? Why don't you see whether or not he can? Why don't you see if you go into that plunge there underneath the blood of Jesus Christ drawn from Emmanuel veins and come up and see whether or not you lose all the guilty stains? I said, the problem is you're bearing your own burden. You can't bear that burden. It's about to kill you, isn't it? I said, I saw you back there. She said, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. I said, I don't need to know what you've done. I know this, that if he can't forgive you of whatever you've done, he can't forgive you of anything. I remember that little old girl, that lip started quivering again and those tears started coming down those cheeks again and now just a little bit slow like the stream was drying up a little bit and just sort of one at a time trickling off and Chaplain Westmoreland comes over there and grabs her and, and calls her by name. She knew her by name and she sat down with her over here in the corner. We rolled up the picture. We got the easel and stuff together and, and before long I looked over there and that little girl's got her head bowed and got her hands clasped together like this and she's shaking because she's crying so, ha so hard but she's not crying tears of frustration and anger and bitterness. She's crying tears of joy. And the correctional officer came at the back door as they do and cracked open that back door and hollered for her pod to come out there and cell block A or whatever she was in. And the girl started to go. And I said, can I ask you a, a question, right? Can I ask you are, you, are you, are you any better? You know what she said when she went out? <laughs> you know what she said? She said, I'm clean now. She said, I'm clean now. You know what? I looked at her right there. Her garments hadn't changed at all. She still had on orange pajamas the orange jumpsuit. Her teeth were still rotted out of her head. She had skin poppers all over. Her hair looked like it was matted together with axle grease. She had pimples all over her face. And, and if you were to judge it, don't take it the wrong way. But sin had used and abused that girl to where she wasn't even hardly fit to look at. But you know what she said? I'm clean now. You say, why? That cleansing that takes place is of your soul. It's not always of your body. But I don't care how dirty you are. You can come to a place, a holy place. And you know what you can do? You can come to that place of refuge. And for you that are saved, you know what he did? He prepared a place for you in 1 John 1, 9. You know what he said? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Old preacher, you know, I heard a preacher preach and told me that if I was sinning, I wasn't saved. Well, then he's got a low opinion of what sin is. <laughs> because you know what he sees himself as? Being righteous enough to never sin. Well, you hadn't read your Bible if you think that. I talked to a preacher yesterday for a good little time, probably a better part of an hour. And you know what he said? He said he heard the preacher that preached and he said, you know, if you're sinning, you're not really saved. And if you're sinning, you haven't come to Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, 1 John 1, 9 is in the Bible to restore your fellowship, not to give you salvation. You know what many of us need today? We need a good bloodbath. We need to come to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I'm dirty. Lord, I've messed up. I've gone places I shouldn't go. That's holes in the feet. I've touched things I shouldn't touch. That's holes in the hand. Lord, I've had uh, uh, thoughts that are bad. That's the crown of thorns around my head. Uh, Lord, I got a hole right here in my heart. That's for my sins of affection. Lord, I've done those things. I don't know what to do. I don't need to be saved again. The Lord said, no, you need to confess and be cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, why? You need to come to a clean place this morning. You know something, I could probably just stop the service right there and just say, you know what, that's enough said right there because if you could get that part down to understand that Kadesh is a, a holy place, it's a clean place, it's a place that when you mess up, as if when He writes it, He understands your human nature never goes away. 
And so He provides a way for you to find a place of refuge. Can you imagine trying to base my salvation on living a perfect life? You cannot do that without compromising what the Scripture says about sin. So, you know what he said? You have two natures now. One is eternally secure and the other one is going to need a constant bloodbath on a regular basis to stay in fellowship with me. Let me hurry. We've only got five more cities to go. hope you're paying attention. The second one, notice he says right here, is called Hebron. I'm sorry, Kaddish. And then he comes down there to a place called Shechem. What is Shechem? That's a place for the hurting. Shechem means shoulder. A shoulder to lean on. Many, many, many times I, I can remember seeing pictures and have even at times uh, been there to comfort somebody and they put their head on your shoulder and that's where you give them comfort. I remember, I've told you before, I won't go into all the details, but I remember when my dad fell in the hospital in his last days and I remember holding him there as he put his head on my shoulder and the nurses cleaned him up. I remember when I held him there by the bed and they brought me that robe and we put that robe around him while my mom was standing over here by the, by the door and all that excrement and all that blood and all the stuff that was there. I remember them after they got him cleaned up there and how ashamed and how embarrassed he was and what a terrible, horrible thing it was. And I remember just, I just remember holding him up there and he was just sort of like a sack of taters just in my, in my arm, just, just hanging on while they did that and, and putting that robe on him and, and cinching that robe down while he had his head on my shoulder. And I remember as I got ready to lay him back into the bed, they had lowered that bed way down so I could ease him over in there. And he's leaning and I begin to lay him back. I remember him taking that big old mitt, that big old paw of his. I remember him patting me on the cheek like this. You say, what did he need? He just needed a shoulder to cry on, a shoulder to lean on. He knew he was in the last days. He knew he was passing. He knew he was going. I have been, had the privilege of being with people when they passed on. And you know what they need sometimes? They just need comfort. They just need somebody to help them. This is a time like that. It's uncertain. Be honest and say, I don't really know what's going on, but I know where I go when I need comfort. I know where I go when I need answers. And even if I don't get answers, just knowing He's in the boat with me, no matter what your place I'm going to wind up being, I'm, the ship may crack up, but the Lord told me He's with me and I'm not going to get tore up until He's ready for me to be tore up. So praise the Lord and batten down the hatches and let's go from there. You know what people need today? They need the assurance of a shoulder. They need a place called Shechem, a place where they can lean on Him. That's what many of you are looking for today, even though you're saved. But life has changed. Will I go back to school? Will I ever go to college? Will I get a scholarship? Will I ever get this restored and that restored? Will I get my business back? Will I, will I be able to ever have a car? Will I have this? Will I have that? I don't know. I can't answer that. But I can tell you this. A lot of that creates and causes a lot of anxiety. Number three is Shechem. And, I mean, number two is Shechem. Number three is Hebron. And that's a place of fellowship. I'm using H's as I have before. That's a place for the homeless. You know, many, many times before we don't realize that once you're saved, you can't extricate yourself from the body of Christ. But you can sure remove yourself from His fellowship. I'm not talking about a physical location now, but I'd like to just run something by you if you'll just bear with me for just a few more moments. Many of you are homeless today. And what we're going through in the last few weeks has made us recognize our relationship with that radio antenna, our relationship with the, with the Lion of the tribe of Judah, that relationship with the center point, the focal point, is not where it ought to be. We're no better than the prodigal who's gone to the pig pen. I wish I could paint because Brother Sean drew me a great picture of the prodigal in the pig pen and outside the pig pen tombstones of people that never made it out of the pig pen. But the pig pen is full of people today that didn't get there because the pig pen of riotous living. Some of them are in the pig pen of own self-indulgence this morning. Some of them are in the pig pen of ambition. Some of them are chasing dreams monetarily or physically. Some of them are chasing a reputation. Some of them are in the pig pen of doing what they want to do instead of what God would have them do with their life. And now the Lord has shut everything down. 
it's a great time to stop and see why am I in this pig pen and how did I get here? What is the pig pen, preacher? It's whatever got you out of the Father's house. Whatever broke your fellowship with the Father. Oh, anger? Sure. Bitterness? Absolutely. Wrath, clamor, evil speaking. Yeah, all those personality traits. Traits. Didn't get what you wanted to get. Didn't get it the way you ought to think you get. Didn't get things run the way they ought. Didn't get the opportunity. Whatever it may be, you know what you are. You're in the pig pen today, but you may not be smoking and drinking and cussing or dressing wrong or doing wrong or having the moral standards of an alley cat. You may not be suffering with a wild ride to swimming and, and those kind of things. You're just not in the Father's house where you ought to be. You're in the pig pen of your own making. You know what this place represents it represents a place to come home to I don't want you to see don't want to see you get comfortable in the pig pen some of you gotten comfortable in the mud and comfortable in the mire I was told this as an illustration but I had a, a farmer that bore it out and he said about pigs he said pigs love the mud but he said if you ever get a sheep he said, you know, it's a strange thing. If that sheep falls into the mud, he cries as if it's the end of his life because it bothers the sheep to be in the mud, but it doesn't bother the pig. That's profound. In 2 Peter chapter number 2, he says, the dogs go back to vomit and the pigs go back to the mire. Where do the sheep go to? They go hang out with the dogs or the pigs. And they become comfortable eating that which is vomitous material that has been thrown up and then regurgitated by somebody else and they gobble it up as if it's sustenance. Boy, that's good. I, I've gotten accustomed to eating other people's vomit. I, boy, that's good. And they just keep vomiting up stuff that should have been swallowed and out the draft. But instead, they're like a chicken. They, they go around and pick up even their own waste and they regurgitate it again. And then they eat it and they chew on it and they eat it and they chew on it. And then they let it go out the draft and then they pick it up again. And that's just where they're just hung. They're just hung in the mire like a chicken, just picking it up and regurgitating. Or they become like that old sow who's not happy until she's laying and wallowing in the mud. You know what this place is? This is a place where you can come home to. That Bible says about the prodigal, and I love to preach on the prodigal, that Bible says about the prodigal, he said, and when he came to himself, he said, the servants in my father's house have plenty enough bread to eat. I will arise and go to my father's house, and I will say I have sinned against heaven and against thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. I just want to be back in the father's house, under the father's care. Watch care eyes of the Father. You know what that Bible teaches you? That Bible teaches this is a place called home. You know the best way to spell home? H-E-A-V-E-N. For us as believers, I've yet to see the testimonies that have, uh, that have uh, come up or surfaced, but for us as believers, uh, for us to die is gain. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. I hope and pray it doesn't affect you. I hope and pray you don't get it. I hope and pray that we reset and get back to where we are. But if we die, better for us. Paul said for me to be out of body to be present with the Lord. Paul said for me to die is great gain. Paul said I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to part for me, for which is far better. Because why? I finally get to go home. But theoretically, have you lost your direction? Are you where you shouldn't be? Are you spending time in the vomitous material of other people just reading and regurgitating all the stuff that's out there even if it's from preachers that are just throwing out all this anger and bitterness and rebellion and frustration and, and they're just trying to get you stirred up because they're stirred up and they're a maverick and you're a maverick and boy, it just makes your flesh feel so good. And let's go. You know, it's like... I was like, no, I do some really good work in jail. I do some really good work in prison. I do some really good work in the hole of the ship. I, I do some really good work in a lion's den. I do some really good work in a fiery furnace. I do the greatest work in times of confinement. And all a Christian wants to do is break free instead of the Lord going, no. You abused your freedom for a long time and I gave you days to set aside for the Lord, but you're using the Lord's day for pig pen recreation. So I just pull it all off the table. I, I know. If we reset, you know what that means? You go right back to doing what you did before you got here without even thinking about 
anything like that. I've got to hurry. Notice what happens is the next one is Beezer. That's a fortified place. That's a place for the helpless. That's a place for the Herbies of the world. That old saint that used to sit on the second row at East Lake Baptist Church, right there. Tommy sat right over here. Tommy was the old bus driver, the semi-driver. He'd show you how to shift into second. My brother would remember him. Herbie'd sit right there on the end of that thing, and I've told you the story. Knock, kneed, pigeon toes, thumbs turned in this way. A place for helpless people. Miss Penny that's up there at the nursing home when she's dying and stuff like that and getting ready to pass from this life to the next. And I'll never forget going over to see her at Baptist South and being in the room there with her, that oxygen mask on her. And I kind of got upset with her. I got upset what was going on. And I'm trying to read her some of the Bible. I think my sister was on the way over there to see her because they grew up around her, knew her for years and, and that kind of a thing. I'll never forget that old sainted woman taking that mask and shoving it up and hair going all over the creation like that. White cotton top hair, man. White is my shirt. I remember her grabbing a hold of my hand like this and looking at me and she said, Now, preacher, I'm going to be okay, but you've got to get a hold of yourself. <laughs> I remember my dad telling a story of when Woodard was out there with him and going by to see Herbie and Herbie talking about the fact that he already had one of his legs cut off and he was going to, Daddy said, Herbie, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to hop around on one leg until Jesus takes me home. My goodness, boy, to have a testimony like that. I mean, the elevator didn't go to the top. The bread wasn't all the way done. I mean, but faithful as the day is long. Daddy would say about Herbie, I wish I had a hundred Herbies. Was he trouble? Yeah. Was he problem? Yeah. Was he difficult? Yeah. Was he loud? Yeah. Was he out of sync? Yeah. Or was he, but, but boy, you talk about faithful. You talk about there every time the doors were open. Hot outside, raining outside, snowing outside, chance of rain outside. It didn't make any difference. That old guy come in there. That's the guy that I told you about that rolled up newspapers with his fingers and tied him with string and then went over and got weighed and then come by the church on the way to his house, dropped by the church because he wanted to put his tithe in. We're going to see him at the judgment seat of Christ. Of course, he'll have his legs and his hands will be where they ought to be. That's the one I told you about, you know, thumbs up and that kind of thing. But, but let, me, let me say this to you. You're going to see him at the judgment seat and with what he had, he did more than some of you do. He was more sold out and doesn't have anywhere near the ability some of you have. You say, what did he do? He found a place to come home. People didn't like him. People didn't care for him. He stunk. I was one of them. I've repented. I've asked the Lord to forgive me and I've asked the Lord to tell him I'm sorry. I'm sure he didn't think nothing of it. I remember one time when he grabbed me to hug me and pulled me up next to that B.O. ridden shirt of his that was dirty and had boogers and stuff all over it. I pushed him away and said, get away from me. And I remember, boy, the hand of God coming down. That would have been spelled B-E-N in my day. I remember my daddy reaching down and grabbed me like he did when the horses got out one time and grabbed me by the seat of the britches and those little teeth gritted this way. And he took me off in that little room over there to the side at East Lake Baptist Church right there in the foyer right in front of everybody I'm hitting about every third step and he took me into that room right there and he shut that door he said boy let me tell you something don't you ever talk to that man that way again you understand me and he said I'll take care of you when you get home you go out there and you apologize to Mr. Herbie that's what I had to call him Mr. Herbie and I went out there and I said uh, uh, Mr. Herbie I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for what I said and I'm sorry for what I did I'll never forget it burning my brain like with a branding iron I'm glad my dad corrected me. I didn't realize the value of a faithful old saint like that. I didn't realize that even though he wasn't in step with everybody else and he wasn't pretty like everybody else and he wasn't fixed up like everybody else, I didn't know at that time how to appreciate that. That old boy died long before I ever got a chance to learn that lesson. You say, why? He found a place to come home. You couldn't have driven him out of that church with a cotton-picking driving machine. And nowadays it's as if people are looking for reasons to get out. I'll tell you why you do. I'm going to tell you why you leave the house. I'm going to tell you why you leave home. I'm going to tell you why you leave that place of comfort, the things that we're talking about here. I'm going to tell you why you leave that, that, that fortified place, that place for the helpless to come to. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you because you came looking for the wrong thing in the first place. That's why you're constantly being talked into coming back to church and back involved and back in the, because you, you didn't get, you were not looking for the right thing. There's a place I preach in North Carolina. I don't know if I ever go back there to preach again. Don't know how things are going to go travel-wise and all that other kind of stuff. But the preacher has up there on the thing, he had a sign made. And he said, and I wouldn't say it's a warm, welcoming sign, but you know what the sign says on the front of that pulpit? His pulpit comes out this way and has a little ledge out here on it that way, sitting right here. He said, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about you. Whew. My 
goodness, man. Can you imagine nowadays you live in a day and time where there's so many stars in the church you can't find Jesus? You know what people need now? They need Jesus. And the church right now is the place where people come to try to find Jesus. I hope when they come here, they don't see you and your anger and your bitterness and your frustration. It's a place for helpless people. Ramoth, notice if you're following me in the passage there, if you come on down there to Ramoth in verse number 8, it's an exalted place. It's a, a place for the hopeless. I shudder to use this as, a, as an illustration, but it's important, I think, for you to know uh, we've had some real tragedies here. I'm not trying to magnify our tragedies to anybody else's tragedies, but we've had some untimely deaths here of some young people, sons and daughters that have been lost. And the church has been a place where people have gathered as best they possibly can to be able to get comfort and to get help in a time of, of need. We've had some horrible things that have occurred and what a terrible time for the church to be in turmoil because of a tragic loss. We've had some big funerals here with a lot of people in attendance who come to this place which represents our relationship with Jesus Christ because it's not the church that gets you through. Excuse me, gets you through. It's Him that gets you through. And your relationship with Him is magnified when you're in this place. You come to a strong place, a fortified place, a place where you can get some help, a, a place where when you're hurting, you have somebody to be able to relieve that pressure from you. I don't know what that loss is like. I, I know that it got a lot more real for me when I lost my dad. I lost Brother Jim. I know many times the testimony of people that would come by that were unsaved from all the countless people that have died when you've lost loved ones. They're, they're all over. They're back here. They're here. They're here. They're there. They're there. They're there. The Carols and their grandson and sons. The Williams. The Magdalene's. The Heikos. The Waters. They're hopeless. And countless times they watch you and they come by and they say, how are you going through this? And countless times I've seen the people mentioned saying, if it wasn't for him, I couldn't make it through it. If it wasn't for him, I couldn't make it through it. We need to be able to understand that the church is representative of our relationship with the Lord. If the Lord died for the church, why wouldn't we be where he died, for, for what he died for. Why wouldn't we be there? Why would there be always this effort to try to get away from what he died for, what he loved, what he gave his life for? Last but not least, there's a separated place. It's called Golan. It's a place for the hindered, the, the tempted. I've known countless numbers of people who have had 12 steps call it an addictive personality. That's their way of saying we don't know why they can't quit this, so we just call it a personality trait and then almost condemn them to saying this is how you're going to be the rest of your life because it's a, a personality trait, although that personality trait is not literally considered a diagnosis. But oftentimes we're hindered by sin, by bad habits. Habits are like easy chairs, easy to get into, man, hard to get up, out of. Easy to get into on Sunday afternoon, hard to get back up on Sunday night and come to church. Easy to get in to Wednesday after work, hard to get back up and get back to church. But it's a separated place. You say, why? Because you should be able to come to church and get away from the world. The church is never intended to be a place that's so community oriented, so people oriented that we bring the ways of the world into the church so that the church looks like the world. No, it's supposed to be a clean place, a separated place, a place where tempted individuals can come to find recluse. They, uh, they can come to find refuge. They can come to find a place where they can get away from the temptation. They shouldn't come to church and be tempted. They shouldn't be tempted by Christians to do things that they shouldn't do. They, this should be a place that's holy and sanctified and set apart, a separated place. It's a place that if you have those troubles, that you should be able to come to to be able to get some relief and to get some sanity about yourself to be able to come back. There's no better time than the time 
right now. Many of you remember me using the story uh, several years ago. I haven't used it in a number of years about my dad's horse named Duke. Now, my brother would remember Duke, but he was a lot younger then. And my brother is 10 times the horseman that I was. As a matter of fact, he was so good with horses. He raised horses for a living, made a living off of buying and selling horses and the way they were trained them in confirmation. He could do things with horses. I, so I don't want you to get the wrong impression that I was Mr. Horseman, but I could ride a little bit in my days. I was a lot thinner in those days, and I could at least sort of stick there, and I didn't mind getting back on if I got thrown off and, and those kind of things. And he had a pony named Redbone, and I had a, a Palomino, and my daddy had Duke. And Duke was a Tennessee walking horse. Mr. Harl Smith took us out there to the Tennessee walking farm one day and said, we're going to buy you a horse preacher. And we started looking at those places. I mean, the floors in that place were so clean you could eat off of them. The paddocks and stuff were made out of cedar and stuff and just absolutely beautiful with the little slats in there. I mean, just like it looked like where thoroughbreds went out in the, the lunging pen. You'd see them working with the horses out there with the whip and the ropes and stuff. I've seen my brother do that a lot of times. But I was a little kid back then and working with those horses and making them do certain things. And I look over here in the riding pen over here and you're going to over here and they're riding and going through their gates and cantering and whatever the dressage is and picking their feet up and I mean just doing magnificent things and back like a table talk and hair up and or tail up in the air like this man I mean just a, just beautiful to look at just beautiful to look at and my daddy said to Mr. Hall I was standing right there he said Mr. Hall I don't know what you're thinking we can't afford no horse like this and he goes I ain't got no place like this for him to stay in anyway he said, well, let me do some looking around here. Well, in the meantime, long story short, Daddy found around the corner there, he found this old sort of red, broken down, bony, hip showing, rib showing, sort of a pink eye infested flies all over him. Some of the sores and stuff where they had put chains along his bottom of his legs down there along his hocks, they had had these chains on him where they had rubbed sores on him. And you could see where they kind of tried to clean him up, but they had just sort of let it go. They just... They just, they just sort of ignored him. And so I remember him coming around and saying, Mr. Hall, I think I found one I'd, I'd like around here, probably can afford him. And Mr. Hall said, preacher, he said, no, they're getting rid of that horse. He said, that horse is no good. He said, you're not a horse trainer, and these are the greatest trainers there were, and they couldn't do nothing with that horse. Now, let's pick you out another one. We'll find you something somewhere. You can start riding right away. I said, no, I'd like, I, like that. I like that one. I like that one. It took four guys to get that horse on that trailer. They got that horse up on that one little single uh, trailer there, single horse trailer, and got going down the road pulling that uh, uh, horse. And we went underneath a railroad trestle there, somewhere there in Tennessee. And when we did, that horse shied, man, and stepped off the back of that trailer, stepped toward the back of that trailer and popped that thing off the hinge. And that thing got caught by the chains that were down here holding it. And we had to get out there and try to get the thing fixed. And very long story short, when we got him into that, a uh, little barn that we had there right off of the Happy Valley Farms was over here and you come around that big corner around that thing and uh, you get up there to that place you pull up there's an old farmhouse over here and we had a uh, pasture of eight or nine acres back over in the corner here and a white barn and the doors of the barn opened up toward the road over here and then you had to take them around to put them into the pasture which is probably not good for us because we didn't know enough to keep them in keep them from getting away but at any rate we took him into that barn right there and put him in that uh, thing. And I remember going in. I didn't know any better. I, I got over there and I just wanted to pet him, you know. And I went to pet him like this. I raised my hand. Well, when I did, he raised up and banged his head on the tin roof of that thing right there and came down and hit one of those one by four slats in that thing and cracked that thing. And my daddy went and grabbed the two by four and nailed it up there. And he said, son, you can't move fast around this horse. He's hand shy. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know what that was. What that meant was is every time somebody raised their hand, he thought he was going to get whooped. He thought he was going to get the tar knocked out of him. Like some of you. You think all God wants to do is beat you down. And if God doesn't beat you down, you know what you do? You beat yourself down for all your failures, all your messes, all the stuff you've done wrong, the places you've been, the things you've done, the divorces you've been through, all the mistakes you've made, the people that you've been with, and the drugs you've done, and the drinking you've done, the jail time you did, and the failed businesses and all that. Uh, the devil don't have to beat you up. God don't either. You beat yourself up. That's Duke. Duke, just constantly. Just, everybody's after him all the time. Just I can see him just constantly blink his eyes and waiting to get the tar. That's because all they've ever done, just beat the tar out of him. 
And he said, you can't raise your hand. He's hand shy. And I got to looking at him. And I said, Daddy, well, he's, got, he's kind of messed up. I mean, look at all that stuff on him and everything. Goo coming out, pus coming out of those sores, some across his hind end where they'd been hitting him with the back. And some of those places had healed up, but they had beat him so much that the hair had, had not even grown back. Just black spots back there where they had beat him in the hair with a whip. And, and the hair hadn't come back on those spots and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, my dad called the veterinarian over there. And Mr. Harl said, uh, Preacher, let me take care of that and thought he was going to put him down. And dad said, I don't want to put him down, but I want to put him to sleep so I can doctor him. And the veterinarian came out there and when he saw that little horse moving around, little old small stall, banging around in that place, boy, like a lion pacing in a cage, he said, uh, I ain't getting in there with that horse. And he said, well, if I can get him over here, will you give him a shot and calm him down enough so I can dress his wounds? And that veterinarian popped him and, you know, I can remember Duke now. Of course, I was still a kid. I can remember him kind of getting wobbly and, and that kind of a thing. And then the next thing you know, he, he kind of hunches down on those front knees. And the next thing you know, he falls and he falls over to the side. And the vet said, you got about 15 minutes. And out comes the betadine and out comes the antiseptic and out comes the eye cream for the pink eye in his eye and out comes uh, and, um, antibiotics and all kind of junk, man. And they're working like a house of fire and scrubbing him and kind of cool. They wrapped him with what looked like racing leggings and stuff like that. Something, not ace bandage, but something to get to, to because of the bad sores on his, on his feet and his legs there. And they doctored what they could and, and directly he started kind of coming around and wobbling his head around and looking all wild eyed and stuff and. He came back up and every day, nearly every day that I remember, my dad would go out there and he'd run his hand down on that big old 50 gallon drum of sweet feed full of molasses and oats and corn and stuff like that. And he'd go over there and he'd real carefully, real easy, he'd run his hand through the fence and just stand there, just stand there, wait. And directly that old horse would come over there wobble-legged and wide-eyed and come over there and he'd, he'd eat a little bit. Dad eventually got where he'd have him eating like this and he'd take his other hand and he'd talk to him real quiet. Just sort of stroke him on that old velvety nose, uh, nose and mouth going to town, those old teeth chomping on that stuff. Give him an apple every now and then, a carrot every now and then. Just talk to him. Just talk to him. Say, what good was a horse? Well, I'm not done with the story yet. I'm trying to hurry. He eventually got to the point he'd slide that gate open and he'd slip inside and he'd have that feed out there and then he'd get up there and he'd run that big old head, rub that big old head and talk to him. Over a period of time he got where he could talk to him a little bit and his sores began to heal up. And he started eating. And the ribs began to disappear and the haunches in the back where his hips showed so vividly began to go and the pink eye began to go away that used to drain down that right eye, just, just pour down there. Just that old, um, I can't think of the name of it now, the red stuff in there, the conjunctivitis was so bad in that thing. That thing just looked like somebody punched him in the eye. Horrible. Gradually that began to go away. He started looking like a, like a real thoroughbred, like a real walker. And directly before long, he got where he could get a bit and a bridle on him and, and then a blanket. Well, you know the story. And eventually they threw a old western saddle on him and that horse was trained to be ridden English style. And I can remember the day that he put that old western saddle on. It was a black saddle with a red inlay for the seat. It had a chest thing with it. It had little leather diamond things. I don't remember if he got it from Mr. Ratchford or not because he was in the leather business. I can't remember where he got that saddle from. Somebody gave it to him because we couldn't have afforded a saddle like that. It had a breast harness and a chin harness on the thing like that and I remember him saddling him up like that, and I'm thinking to myself, man, he is going to pitch your hind end in the dirt today. <laughs> That's what I thought. I shouldn't have thought that, but I did. I thought to myself, Daddy, you ain't ridden that horse. I don't know what you think you're going to do. That horse is going to throw you off. It's still mean. He said, boy, get the gate. I remember him getting up on that horse and had those long things coming down off the stirrups like they looked like something Roy Rogers would put on the trigger or, or silver, whichever one. I think that was the Lone Ranger had silver, but one of those, those fancy, fancy deals like that. I remember him taking him out there and taking him right out there in the yard area right there where the little corralled area is there. I remember as he came by the gate, 
I remember him leaning up, right? Because you had the duck coming out. He had that gray hat on. He had on a gray uh, jacket. And he had on his cowboy boots. No spurs. I remember when he came by me, he came by me on the left right there, and I'd swung that door open there, that piece of two by four coming across that door like that to open it. I remember that thing ah, swinging like that. And I'm thinking, man, as soon as that horse sees that road out there, he is going to bolt and run 90 to nothing. I remember my dad leaning up over that horse and whispering in his ears, he said, show him what you got, boy. He went out there, and the next thing you know, he goes through five of about eight gates and never missed a beat. He winds up working up a sweat and a lather, and in those days, a leather rubbing against that skin and stuff, and that sweat begins to turn into foam, and that foam begins to, to start coming off of him. And the next thing you know, boy, I mean, he's out there, and I mean, he is working to beat the band. Man, I mean, sweating like nobody's business. My daddy could have drank a glass of tea on the back of that horse. That horse's back's not even moving. That horse's legs are just churning, boy, and those muscles are rippling, and he is going to town. And it's almost kind of like he, he realizes and recognizes people were watching, and that tail came up, and that head came back, and he hit those gates like that. I remember when he came in and put that old horse back up in that barn, and he came over there, and he began to clean him up and scrape him down and then get the brush and wipe him down and all that kind of stuff. And... My brother and I, had you have to put halter ropes on them and then take them around and take them into the pasture and, and turn them loose and all that. And that's another story. And we were in there and Daddy's got a hold of uh, his horse and he's getting ready to come out. I remember him coming out and I remember my dad walking out and he's petting Duke's nose like this. And that rope's trailing the ground. He don't even have a hold of the rope. If he did, he must have had it in his left hand because he's just going like this. And that horse follows him all the way around to the other side and we open up that little flimsy gate area that we fixed up there and strung that bob wire ourselves, and stuff. And he turned him out into that pasture and he pulled the gate behind him. You know what he said? He said, Duke, old boy, you're home now. You're home now. You're fed now. You're safe now. You're secure now. No matter what your past is and you may bear the scars from the past, you're home now. You're not going to be abused now. You're not going to be taken advantage of now. You're not going to have somebody that mistreats you. And when I raise my hand, it'll be to give you some food, not to hurt you. And when I ride you, it's not to try to run you in the ground or to show for myself. It's to give you the opportunity to you fulfill your dreams. You're home now. You're home now. I can remember time and time again, I think probably my brother would remember, but you'd come, we'd be in that old red Chevrolet pickup truck, had a white top on it in the cab. It's an old one. I don't know what they called them in those days. It's an old Chevrolet. You come around by Happy Valley Farms and you make that 90 degree turn and you could see right over here, you'd look down the left hand side, you could see the corner of our property there. And a lot of times the horses would be out there eating where you could see them. And every now and then you'd see Duke look up and he'd see that red truck coming. And he looked like, you know, this. And then the next thing you know, man, by the time we got to the gate, Duke would be standing right there at the gate. My daddy get out and he'd say, hey, boy. And Duke would say, <laughs> like that. He said, you want something to eat, Duke? He'd walk over there and give him a sugar cube. He's bad about eating things. He had a pair of leather gloves. If you had anything on it, Duke grab a hold of it and pull it off, pop it off. He'd, he's bad about it. The very thing he used to be afraid of, he'd take food out of. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me today? I'm trying to tell you that there's no place for refuge like Jesus Christ. By two immutable things that God cannot lie, He becomes an anchor for you to be able to hold on to, a very present help in a time of need, a place of refuge, a place of comfort, a place where you can come in and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, be merciful to me, a backslider. Lord, be merciful to me during a time of difficulty and trouble. Give me some direction. Give me some light. But hide me, protect me, and keep me safe during a time like this. Give me wisdom. Help me to know what to do. That's what you need. That's what this message is about. Some of you, even as Christians, have been abused like that old horse was abused. You know what the Lord wants to do? He wants to do what He did for Elijah under the juniper tree. And I'm done. And I'm done. Just hold dinner for just a minute. Roast beef, mashed potatoes, biscuits, in the oven. They're ready to get them out before they burn. But, but listen to me. Elijah was a great old preacher, but God saw some things in that preacher that never allowed him to expect more out of Elijah than human nature could provide. Because when Elijah messed up, and he's in the throes of depression and discouragement, 
being downtrodden and disappointed. He curls up under the juniper tree and the Lord shows up Himself. Doesn't send an angel. Doesn't send another prophet. He comes Himself. And while Elijah would have expected to be chastised, instead he found a place of warmth and a place of light, a place of food and a place of water and a place of fellowship. And right now that's what some of you need. I don't have answers for you as to what tomorrow holds in the physical realm. I can tell you one day soon in the spiritual realm, whether by death or rapture, life as we know it will forever change. Not just the landscape of a nation or our economic situation, but our life will forever change. All I want to encourage you to do today is to turn your eyes back on that radio tower. Let the Lord be your vision, as the girls sang. And Lord say, by your grace, I'm not going to take my eyes off of the center point of the city that no matter where I'm at, I know how to get back to where I'm at. That's the invitation today. That's what the message is about. Jesus Christ, the place, the person of refuge. Heavenly Father, we'd ask now your blessings upon the service, upon the message. Lord, somewhat lengthy, somewhat long. But Lord, I'd pray that whoever might have heard it today might have been helped, strengthened, and encouraged. Might help us to realize that no matter what the situation or the circumstance, there is never anything wrong with checking our relationship with you. And though we may not have all of the answers that we seek in the physical realm, might we forever trust in you and keep our eyes forever stayed upon thee. Forgive us, Lord, where we failed. Forgive us, Lord, where we've been frightened. Help us to be today a changed individual that says, Lord, okay, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I sure am glad I'm in fellowship with you today. Bless these people, Lord, that have been faithful so long. Could you give us wisdom this week? Could you show us this week what we are to do? and guide and direct us in all that we say and do. And we'll give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.